so my name is Ruben Bins. I'm going to be talking about the distinction between individual fairness and group fairness. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these slides in the interest of, uh, of time. Um, so let's take a really simple example. Let's imagine we are uh, a college or a university and we have to make decisions about uh, which people we're going to admit to study at our institution. Imagine we have a data set containing examples from previous applications. Uh, the uh, individuals who have a, uh, a cross, that indicates that they were good students, they performed well. And those with a circle, that indicates they, they were uh, not good students. Uh, and maybe the X and Y axis is like uh, SAT scores or exam scores or something like that. And further, let's assume that the red and blue labels correspond to, uh, to a protected class like gender or race. So we could create a decision boundary like this that would allow us to make predictions about uh, new students um, uh, to see whether we want to admit them or not. And the question is, is this fair? So in, in the sort of typical um, fair machine learning literature, there'll be different ways of measuring fairness. So one might be um, outcome parity. So we look at the proportion of uh, red and blue populations that got a positive prediction. Uh, error parity would look at the distribution of errors. So in this case, there's a higher false negative rate for the reds. Um, and we could improve these group fairness measures by changing the decision boundary, or we could have two different decision boundaries depending on whether you're red or blue. Um, and then there's equal calibration. So this says that if you have a scale with different levels on the scale, for each level on the scale, your chances of having a positive or negative label should not depend on whether you're red or blue. Um, so I'll just skip through those. Individual fairness is slightly different because it, um, it is based on comparisons between individuals. So people who are similar in their task relevant features should be treated similarly. And what this means in practice is that we would have to compare the individuals on either side of our decision boundary. Um, and the distance function or distance metric that we're using here is one that's deferred to a policymaker. So there's a policymaker who has somehow divined the features that are going to be important for this, uh, this um, individual fairness metric. And then if there are only two individuals who are too close together, according to this fairness metric, then and they get different outcomes, then that's individually unfair. So the question, how do these two uh, measures conflict? Well, for instance, um, sorry, I skipped that one. So for instance, if we have two different decision boundaries, look at this pair of individuals here, they might be really similar on the individual fairness metric, but they're going to get different outcomes because they're being subjected to different decision thresholds. Similarly, we might have a conflict due to a change in decision boundary. So we might change our decision boundary to make our model more group fair, and that might slice between two individuals who are seen as, ind as individually uh, similar with respect to the task. So the question I have is, do these different measures of fairness conflict at a fundamental sort of philosophical level? Do they correspond to normative principles that, have, uh, that are distinct and that conflict with each other? So individual fairness is often justified by an appeal to a notion of consistency. Like cases should be treated alike. The first thing to note here is that whether we go for individual fairness or group fairness, Machine learning decisions are consistent by default, assuming that we have a, a model which, is, uh, which generates uh, outputs as a deterministic uh, uh, function of the inputs. The second thing to consider is that when we say like cases are treated alike, there's an implicit assumption that there are certain features that we want to compare and some that we don't want to compare on. So why would you include certain features in this similarity metric and not others? So I think to answer that kind of question, we need to turn to um, theories of egalitarianism. So these answer the question about what features are an acceptable basis for different outcomes. Uh, one example of that would be luck egalitarianism. They say that differences are OK unless they're the result of brute luck, so circumstances that are outside of your control. And so you can imagine from a group fairness perspective, we might justify a group fairness measure by saying, well, uh, it's, it's a matter of brute luck whether you are on the wrong side of a uh, structural um, injustice and therefore we take group membership as a proxy for that and we want to control for that. 
But I think you could also use egalitarianism to justify a particular version of individual fairness. So if you think about the original justification for individual fairness as this consistency, um, it, we do need to consider certain features and not others to make sense of it. And in the original paper on, um, on individual fairness, there's a suggestion that a decision maker who's creating this individual distance uh, metric, a fairness metric, uh, could include certain kinds of uh, considerations about structural disadvantage. So they say, well, you know, in, in college admissions, it's common for admissions tutors to weight the uh, SAT scores of an applicant based on whether they came from a disadvantaged school. And so my argument is if we're going to allow um, appeals to what school you went to as a, as a relevant consideration in the individual fairness metric, then why not also allow appeals to group membership, which is another kind of proxy for uh, discrimination. So maybe the exam scores, if we just consider exam scores, the distance between the uh, pairs of individuals looks like this, but when we factor into, the account, in, into our account that the red population has some kind of structural disadvantage, maybe the distances are more like this. So you might be thinking, well, hang on, uh, isn't the good thing about individual fairness that it's focusing on individuals and not on groups? And it's, uh, if, you, if you believe this, then it sounds like what you're going for is a notion of individual justice. Individual justice, uh, unfortunately, is not going to be satisfied by either group fairness or individual fairness, because we're still using a statistical model to make a generalization about an individual. So if you believe in individual justice, then you, um, then unfortunately, uh, even individually fair models will not work, and maybe you shouldn't be using machine learning at all for this kind of thing. So I think, I want to suggest that we can dissolve this conflict in practice if we focus on the more important question, not of between individual uh, comparisons or group uh, fairness, but between two assumptions. One assumption being that the disparity between red and blue is due to differences in talent or effort or things that we'd hold them responsible for. Or on the other hand, whether we believe that the disparities are due to circumstances such as structural injustice. Uh, I'm going to skip through these last few slides. Uh, so whichever assumption we make, it's possible to find a version of group fairness or individual fairness that will correspond to that assumption. And personally, I think that the, the second assumption that disparities due to Structural injustice is usually the right one. But when we're arguing about individual versus group fairness, that's a kind of a, a, a non, uh, sort of the, the less significant question. The significant question is which normative or empirical assumptions we're going to make. So I'll end with that. Thank you.